Thank you for tuning in to the Practical Preservation Podcast. Please take a moment to visit our website, practicalpreservationservices.com, for additional information and tips to help you restore your historical home. If you've not done so, please subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, and also like us on Facebook. Welcome to the Practical Preservation Podcast, hosted by Danielle and Jonathan Kepperling. Kepperling Preservation Services is a family-owned business based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, dedicated to the preservation of our built architectural history for today's use as well as future generations. Our weekly podcast provides you with expert advice specific to the unique needs of renovating a historic home, educating by sharing our From the Trenches preservation knowledge and our guests' expertise, balancing modern needs while maintaining the historical significance, character, and beauty of your period home. Today on the Practical Preservation Podcast, I have uh, Tom Brennan with me from, is it Elmore? Yes, yes uh, the in Elmore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Elmore in um, in Detroit, Michigan. So uh, tell me a little bit about your background. Well, I have a bit of a varied background. Um, I have both a civil engineering background and a business background. Uh, my And I have experience in both, but uh, my longest career was was with Accenture as a management consultant. And uh, in that I worked throughout the United States and then throughout the world and lived in Japan for a few years. So I have both this business side and the kind of the engineering side. Right. So that, um, and then when I retired, uh, put that in quotes, (laughs) in 2001, I uh, got involved with a sustainability project in Monroe, Michigan, with a startup nonprofit there, and learned a lot about sustainability. So, uh, and then my wife and I led a group um, in uh, the Detroit area that uh, studied sustainability really for five years. Then, before we got involved with the Green Garage and then the Elmore. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, very, very interesting. I think. I think sometimes having like a wide range of experiences and also training helps to look at things a little bit differently than maybe other people would. So I, I think that that's, yes. a, that's a benefit. So, so yeah. tell me, tell me about the, the um, projects that you've developed. I know um, it's the, the Elmore and then you mentioned the green garage. So tell me a little bit about the projects that you you've developed with as an adaptive reuse, but then also with sustainability in mind. Right. So the, well, we've done uh, two, uh, and we're on our third project. So the first one was the Green Garage, which uh, was a former Model T showroom uh, built in 1921 during the automotive boom in Detroit. It was uh, what was called a, a service center at the time. And uh, it produced uh, Ames automotive uh, automobiles built on the um, the Model T chassis. Mm-hmm. Um, we then acquired uh, we acquired acquired that building, and, and then converted it to a, a co working space, which is what it is today. And there's 50 businesses there. Oh, um, and we did we did. Um, almost a two-year design of trying to, and this is what I think your listeners might be interested in, is how to take a, you know, a 1921 building and make it, we were attempting to make it net zero energy. Um, So uh, within an urban area. So there's not a lot of land, you know, to put solar panels on and all that. Uh, We are in, both these buildings are in historic districts. So we would need historic district approval for everything that we did. So that's another thing that kind of fits into your, um, your listenership. They're dealing with these kinds of questions and, and that. So, um, 
that project was completed in uh, November of 2011. And we, again, now have 50 businesses there. It's uh, been successfully running. And on a sustainability point, um, we have been, well, you can get me going on this, but we've been <laughs> installing, um, I'm sorry. So our strategy is first to reduce the amount of energy that we use, that's step one, right. and then to meet the remaining demand with reusable energy. So we uh, we we operate at one-tenth the waste, water, and energy of a normal office building. Okay. Uh, we measure everything. If someone wants to go to our website, they can see everything. It's all charted there. Um, but what's happened is uh, with the decline in the cost of solar um, since when we started and right. we're working in 2010 till today, um, we have ended up putting, uh, we, we had solar thermal panels on the building and now we have solar PV or electric panels. And we're doing a, a pretty good job on our, we're going to be essentially off the grid on our plug loads and, you know, the, all the appliances, lights mm -hmm. and all that right. uh, will be off the grid for uh, 10 months now. Um, so we will be supplying our own energy for 10 months. So right. we are getting uh, pretty darn close to that uh, goal that we had. But you know, it's uh, sustainability is a journey. You have to start is, somewhere yeah. and then yeah. you, you kind of just keep, you just keep working at it. Right. The, um, um, I, have a, I have a couple questions about the, well, the solar, was that hard to get through the historic um, approval process? Or well, are you putting it um, on the it, secondary? It, well, it kind of was and it wasn't. Okay. Uh, you have to remember, I think Detroit is, in a different, uh, you have to, uh, again, remember when this was all happening for the Green Garage, and then we'll talk about the Elmore, but the Green Garage was happening and opening in, you know, it, we were developing it in 09, 010. Oh, yeah, so you, yeah, you they were just happy somebody city, was developing. <laughs> a city yes. that is going through bankruptcy. Right. Hang on, excuse me. So oh, hang on, I, I would stop again, sorry. No, oh, you're good. So Detroit, I, I, that was at the height of the of the financial crisis. And, That's right. and you were, and so I'm, they were happy to probably have anybody developing. So yeah. exactly, yeah. so they were, I would say more uh, accommodating, uh, right. although oh, through that process, I think, which, um, I think gaining the confidence of your historic district commission is a big thing. I agree. So yeah. We, you know, we went to great lengths in the rent in the renovation to respect the history of the building. And so because we were there, you know, we had done all of that. And we, I'm sorry, we involved them early in the process. Right. So we got yeah. them in the building before we even had a set of plans. You know, right. we walked the building. We said, what are you concerned about? So what we did was, and we've done this on all of our buildings. If anybody is walking on the sidewalk in front of our building, we do not want to have the solar panels visible to them. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we go out of our way to try to make that, minimize that, um, and then we've worked, so then we earned their trust, and, mm -hmm. and we've worked with them, uh, we do a lot of repurposing of historic materials, things right. that, that they work with, that they're trying to save, so we've helped to save some of those things, so over the years, we have kind of a collaborative relation. I don't think they cut us extra slack. They just right. trust that. If well, we I, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Cause I, I find that when I go in, if, if they understand that we're trying to do, have the same goals as them, then they they're more comfortable than if you're going in and, and, you know, proposing vinyl windows or, you know, or some, you know, something that would be not, not in, 
at all exactly. in keeping with what they want to do. Exactly. So, so you show a respect for the history and all that. And then at the same time, we're saying the only reason, the only way this building is going to end up being saved in the long run is it's got to be energy efficient and it has to, you know, right. be able to be sustainable. So, so we're very careful on that, but we have now installed 20, we have now 56, um, PV panels on the on the building, okay. um, and I you know if you walked by you wouldn't know it at all, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But That's, it's now, yeah. Um, yeah. and there's been a lot of in advancements there that oh, is there actually helpful yeah. for historic buildings. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah. And the um, the sustainability and preservation was the was the project that you were involved in in Vermont. Was that a historic building or was it a new building that they were just trying to Ver make? Vermont. Yeah. Oh, I oh, haven't uh, been involved with anything. Oh no, I was I was I thought you said that the a, a first sustainability project that you were involved in was in Vermont, and I was just curious if that. Oh, was in also Monroe. Oh, in sorry, Monroe. in okay, Monroe, sorry. Michigan. Yeah, oh, that's right. Sorry. And I, so that. I, yep. I, I wrote that down incorrectly. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I love that, Vermont. <laughs> is that, so, uh, was that also an adaptive reuse? I was just curious. If no, it, that, okay. uh, well, it, it wasn't and it was. It okay. was done by the IHM religious community. It's a women's religious community. And the project was actually the, um, was the River Raisin Institute, which was around um, clean water and environmental practices, but they themselves had redone the mother house down there in a sustainable way. And, and in fact, that is what inspired us to do something in Detroit. Yeah, that, I was just curious work. because I, I do think that there was a real intersection of preservation and adaptive reuse and sustainability. Um, there but is. I don't think I don't think a lot of people make that over the leap that over overlap leap. So I was just curious. Right. And we have. Of, yeah. Yeah. It, I, I don't know. I mean, so just to let you know that 90. Let's see. We reused 75 percent of the materials from the green garage in the building itself. Um, we had one dumpster. In the entire project. That's Everything amazing. else was recycled yeah. or reused. Um, so, I mean, it's it, that focus there and reusing all the material. We took the drywall there and actually stacked the drywall in new walls so that it created a thermal mass, you mm -hmm. know, in the building. Right. So yeah. we put it into the flooring system, uh, extra drywall for thermal mass because we have radiant heating. Oh, so. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, uh, I would say we went not, well, we went to a level of extreme there um, to just test because we had a lot of volunteers that were interested in testing the limits of everything. Right. But by and large, everything that we did, I'm sorry, we're science-based. We're not, we're not green-based. Mm -hmm. We're we're science-based, so right. we're not interested in looking green. We're interested in performance. So, right. So you're looking at so the we building, had yeah. So we had, you know, 30-year engineers that do building, you know, volunteering mm -hmm. their time to try to see if how far we could move this. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. That's, very, um, that's very interesting, and I think they were probably excited to see because they probably don't get a lot of projects that want to push push that far. Exactly. So they, want, they wanted to see. <laughs> yeah, well, the, you know, what they said is we finally have an opportunity to do it right, that right. to do it yeah. right. Yeah. So, uh, and they knew that if they put their time in that we would follow through and honor that and, you know, and to do it. Um, so we, we held design meetings with the Net Zero and, and that group still, you know, still is involved with the project all those volunteers yeah yes yeah yeah, yeah. i'm sure there's a people and i and i thought that when i was looking at the um elmore um site you know the people who want to live their values that that's what i thought the, the yep. people that you're tapping into um 
Yeah. They, you know, they want to live in a sustainable way. They want to, you know, and, and this gives them the opportunity to, is that kind of your vision with, with that space? Right. So the, right. So the green garage is how to work sustainably. Right. And right. then the Elmore is how to live sustainably. We have both. So the Elmore project, we acquired the building. It had been abandoned for around 15 years. Um, and it, um, and we acquired it in 2010, again, during the financial right. crisis. Um, and then with a goal of how to develop some place to live sustainably. So we had both uh, residents that lived there permanently, as well as it's a Elmore Lodge where people can stay um, there um, on an overnight. It's like a boutique hotel. Right. Yep. Uh, basis. Um, and during the 2010 um, crisis, the people that uh, the business that owned it went under. And then the, the, uh, that business, their assets then were owned by a bank and then the bank failed. Oh no. <laughs> yep. So the the building was actually owned by the FDIC. It was being put up for auction on a third party that they had hired to deal with all of the right. oh my goodness. All the real yeah. estate that was just collapsing at the time. So it was actually on on an auction block or going to an auction right. block in Houston, Texas. Oh, <laughs> if you can believe it. So our community development organization got a hold of me and I got involved and began to talk with them about, um, you know, who we were and that we were interested in preserving it because it actually preserves a neighborhood. Right. Um, so Detroit was at a very fragile stage. Uh, that area of Detroit was at a fragile stage at that time. And so if you, if these buildings start to collapse or someone buys it, lives in California, well-intended, but the thing, and I'm just picking California, but right. they're not in the neighborhood. They don't know right. what's happening to the building and all that. So we acquired it and then we began maintaining it and then going through another whole process of how to develop it sustainably. So and, you, get, um, you did the green garage first and then you and then you did this building so did yep. you take the so the green garage learned? opened in yeah. 11 we okay. acquired the elmore in 10 and then we opened that up uh, the elmore opened up in 2016 okay and did you did you did you feel like that process was easier because you had gone through the green garage process or was it yeah it's a good it's a good point so um i would say half of the answer is ye uh, a big yes because we were already familiar with all the technology, the sustainability design techniques and all of that. Right. And the other half was no, because um, this was now a four story building, <laughs> right. you know, yeah, it's a uh, bigger, not a yeah, bigger one space, story yeah. building. And we were doing it, you know, we're building, you know, uh, 12 kitchens and, you know, right. the complexity yeah. of the building. It was a very complex um, design project to try to pull this off. We added uh, rooftop cabins on the top. So we added a fifth floor. We, um, we had to build an elevator building next to it. Oh yeah. Um, for access. So all of that really got us, um, into some space where we hadn't been before. Also, uh, we had to take down all the plaster and all the lath, um, you know, in the building. So there was a lot of deconstruction that had to be done right. um, to that building to even get it to the starting point of going forward. Um, we had to do, you know, board of zoning appeals because there were issues with regards to use. And so it, it was, um, it was quite complex there were there's six pieces of property there and um it was it was just a, a maze uh, a real estate maze 
They were owned by different people. Oh my goodness. They were in different situations. Some were owned by, uh, there was property that were legally owned by three three different entities oh, could goodness. claim ownership. So it was just this long process to clean yeah. all that up um, and then to start moving forward on the project. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that, that does sound, and, and I, it, that, I, that front end then very, sounds very complicated, but I would imagine, you know, putting different apartments in and hotels, like you have to meet all of the, the different requirements than, you know, just a, a, a warehouse space with, with working spaces. Right. And, and then that. we're de designing uh, both uh, an apartment building and a hotel all together. Right. So how yeah. does that operate? Right. Yeah. And then there we did geothermal, um, oh, you know, for our heating and cooling. Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up with 72 um, um, can you pause again? Oh, Just... sure. So I know you mentioned that you're using a tenth of the energy usage. Um, is that for both both buildings or both projects? Uh, no, the Elmore is about twenty percent okay. of the of the energy. Though so it has seventy two solar panels, it has geothermal, but the uh, the difficulty of the building was the building itself. Okay. Um, with the Elmore or with the Green Garage, it was just one essentially main room, you right. know, and so you were getting the thermal envelope, this is five floors, you know, existing windows, and you're trying right. to get that thermal envelope locked down. And it's just, yeah. I mean, it had a center staircase, it had a center, actually, oh yeah, a center light shaft that came down in it. Um, uh, it was a very uh, complicated uh, envelope to try to um, seal up. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I was thinking, did you, um, when you were talking about that ceiling, did you then, how did you insulate? Did you just insulate the roof or how did you, how did you insulate? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, right. So uh, let's just take the green garage. The green garage <laughs> is a thermos that, that is all rigid, ins uh, rigid insulation. We right. used reclaimed uh, rigid insulation okay. and it is um, we built a floor above the concrete floor. Mm -hmm. We built a wood floor above it. So we have actually insulation there. That insulation ties into the insulation on the walls that then goes up and ties into the rigid insulation right. on the roof. On the roof, what we did is there was a historic, and you can see it behind me here. Mm -hmm. um, that's the historic roof but we built a structural roof above that roof. Yeah, we've done that Using the too. trusses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we put rigid in there. So we have rigid in the floor, in the walls, and in the roof, all tied together right. and foamed together. So it's, it has, it's, it's a very yeah. tight, um, very tight building. Uh, but down at the Elmore, it was a balloon type of construction. Oh, yeah. Um, from 1898. Um, and um, you know, trying to get the insulation, yeah. um, it was a real challenge. Uh, we've done a great job on it, but you know, I would say it's um, you just couldn't get to where you could get to on the uh, green right. garage. Yeah, the yeah. same level. It's just yeah, it's just more more complex. And those that balloon framing, the the air that just makes a channel for the air to go up. <laughs> it does. Yeah, you know it. And then we had a center yeah. staircase, you know, that had you know, had a top. I mean, it's oh, just, yeah, yeah. It's just and I'm sure it's beautiful and it's a, it's a great architectural feature, but it wasn't, it wasn't made to keep, keep the heat in. <laughs> no. So, so we, and the other thing that we found to be uh, honest is that um, for people that are doing this work, I, I would say that you can get to 80% being, I love you have practical preservation. Right. So there's practical sustainability. You can right. get 80% of your energy out of your building if you stay in the practical. That last 10% starts to add additional uh, costs, but the big deal is the complexity. 
Right. Um, you just start to add a lot more complexity. And by the time we finished the green garage and then we were doing the Elmore, I just did not want to take on that complexity when we have people living there and guests staying overnight. Right. I mean, you right. just can't, you yeah. know, you can't have something happening that is, you know, you got to get an engineer involved to try to figure out how to you how know, to make a it, yeah. correction or something. Yeah. 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 Now I, so I we, we simplified our systems a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of them at the Elmore. Uh, so, but, um, yep. Okay. So, and you mentioned um, that you retained the original windows at the Elmore? No. Oh. Well, the, the original window openings, you openings. couldn't, okay. you, there's no way to do the original windows. Mm -hmm. So we have, so on sustainability, the envelope is a big deal. We right. had come up with an approach that has since, you know, is used often now and recommended. Uh, we did it before anybody recommended it, which is we put a, you have your brick wall and then you have an air gap and we maintain that with um, just um, insulated spacers. Right. Um, so you have an air gap um, and then that, you know, you have weep holes on the outside and then you have your rigid insulation and then we put uh, kind of a false wall inside and then we do um, uh, the, um, the cellulose on there. Right. And the reason you don't do all foam and all that, it, it makes the room more unnatural. It, it has no ability to absorb and release right. um, humidity where the cellulose will absorb the humidity and then release it, you know, with people mm -hmm. in a building. Right. Um, so, so that has worked really well for us where you, you know, I mean, we've used it on buildings and then we're helping other people on some buildings and we're using it there too. It has a really uh, a great feel to it. So uh, our sustainability is uh, the envelope first, which includes windows and doors. The right. windows we use, um, we used Kelly window um, and they did a lot of historic window work in Detroit. And we use Cardinal 366 glass, which is a yeah. high performance glass. We've used that before um, also. Yeah. Okay, yep. So, um, and so we use that and then um, and then, you know, all, all of our doors, the weather stripping and all of that. So you've got the envelope and then we do high efficiency heating and cooling. We do all electric. We don't do any gas. We do um, then on the, you know, that the ventilation standards right now are, are in the code is right. quite high. So you yes. need a lot of makeup air. So we use energy recovery units. Um, uh, so ERVs to bring the fresh air in, and then when it exhausts the air, it exchanges the energy, um, you know, in the winter, for example, right. it will transfer about two thirds of the energy from the outbound air to the inbound air. Um, and so then you're preheating the air before it gets to the, the system itself. Um, and so the, so we, so the ERV is a big part of it. We have our geothermal systems, you know, are a big part of it. Right. And then you put on top of that, then you put all of your um, uh, solar panels that are then powering that, that geothermal or the, or whatever appliances. Yeah. And, and that's, I was, yeah, lights. I was going to ask you if you had made the decision to do all electric with the eye towards solar, you were eventually going to just be all solar and then it yeah. is. Yep. Uh, yeah. That is one. And the, uh, yep. Th that's a big one. Yeah. Um, we use a little bit of gas down at the, at the Elmore um, for some of our hot water needs down there. Um, it just ended up hot water in <laughs> when you combine a hotel and apartment you hot need a lot of hot water. Just, uh, <laughs> you almost need a PhD to figure this stuff out. Yep. Yeah. If they provide one a PhD in in uh, hot water design, but it's <laughs> it's it is kind. You know, it's there's a lot there. 
there yeah. is there, and 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 you have a lot of a lot of usage and and you need to have hot water when you turn it on so yeah i could see that would be that would be a, a challenge in, in designing that system yep so that's that you know get get the energy down with the envelope the windows and the doors and then that's all passive design and then then the the thing is we're trying to meet that in the most efficient way and now with you know, solar is really coming on with its, um, I don't know if you know, but a cost of a watt produced by a solar panel today versus 2010, it's 80% less. Really? I didn't realize it was that much. I knew they were coming down in price. I didn't realize it was yeah, that much. It's, yeah, it's dramatic. So we, we have been investing in uh, solar uh, again, you know, w without impacting um, those being visible on mm -hmm. historic buildings. Yeah. Yep. Very, very good. And then we do, uh, I would say the last thing is all this repurposing, you know, you can repurpose at a, at a building level. Right. So the green garage was automotive repair and now is a co-working space. Then the Elmore, there had been developers looking at it for years and passing on it because it could not survive as an apartment building. Right. You just could not get the rents to cover the cost of, um, of bringing yeah. it back up. So we, came, when we came in, figured that out pretty quickly, but then moved to a, um, you know, a hotel, or, you know, or bed and breakfast right. kind yeah. of model. And that, that um, really changes your revenue numbers yeah. and then makes, makes then the renovations possible. Right. Yep. And that, that makes sense to me from a, and, and, you know, I know that like a lot of times when there's adaptive reuse, they're trying to balance the, the, the development costs with, but, but the, that, I mean, that's some of the struggles. I, I had a podcast guest a couple months ago that was talking about, you know, the, the Airbnbs and those, you know, buying all these houses in the historic districts and then nobody is living there, but they're the people who are, own the houses are making more money than they would if they were renting them to, you know, on a right. monthly right. basis. So that makes sense to me. And, and that's kind of a nice balance that you, you struck there. Right. Yeah. So, but then on adaptive reuse, it just goes, um, you know, our fencing that goes around it was reclaimed from a Jewish cemetery North of, of the city. Uh, our greenhouse building, all the limestone came from a church, all the windows came from a building that was two miles north of there. The roof came actually from a historic district meeting in which a woman was getting permission to take her roof or clay tile roof off. Uh -huh. And I just raised my hands in the meeting saying, hey, we'll take the, yeah. you know, we'll Don't take throw it, it away. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, someone actually by then a couple of meetings later, a woman was getting permission to get her gar historic garage doors off and uh, historic Boston Edison. Uh, a, a commissioner said, hey, call the green garage. They'll take them. We did. We're yeah. using them you know, on the building, That's great. Um, all of our lath that we took off, we, if you look at our rooftop cabins, they were, the walls are covered with the historic lath. We then worked with a local um, architectural salvage company to actually make a material where we glued the lath together and then that gave us kind of like this laminate boards. Right. We used yeah. then those laminate boards to make the beds. Oh. Um, for there, we used the, uh, the, the knob and tube um, ceramics mm -hmm. to inlay in the beds. <laughs> um, we found some historic um, doorknobs uh, while digging the, the basement to the elevator building. We found a box of them, so we use those on the beds to decorate the beds. Oh, that's so, fun. Yeah. so all I mean, we just whatever we find, uh, we found some uh, galvanized siding, and you can see those. We use that for tabletops in the up in the cabins. We use that for the signs. Um, <clears throat> On the floors, another thing that's very interesting that I think might be helpful. So instead of, to some of your listeners, 
um, and I got educated on this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had, we had, you know, uh, maple floors in there, oak and, or I'm sorry, ash floors, ash and oak floors. But over the years, the four of the eight original apartment building, it, uh, apartments that were in the building got cut up over and over again and oh, yeah. one time there were 40 in there you know kind of units there were walls that went into the middle yeah. of a window you know oh, I mean goodness. like yeah. figure that out um, but on the floor what we did is instead of tearing the floor out and then putting it back in we just inlaid where the floors had been cut Oh, yeah. So you can see the old wall. You can see the wall. So we're actually preserving that footprint. You right. know, that, I don't know, let's just say 25 unit went from eight to 25 units. Mm -hmm. We preserved that 25 unit footprint. Right. So you could see it in the floor. Um, we didn't exaggerate it. You know, we put in matching wood right. but you can see the cut lines yeah. of where the old walls were um so I, that you know that's a way to save the old the history um, right that is right in the building it tells the story uh, it tells the story yeah, yeah. that's exactly right yeah. yep of what you know of where the building came from where we came from yeah in, uh, yeah and i city. think that so that the building itself was it, uh, the Elmore is an 1898 AC Barney, uh, AC Barney building. It has uh, Lake Superior red sandstone um, on it. It was built by Charles Moore, who had a building, a home right, right, essentially next door to it. Um, uh, and this was in an area of Detroit that was called the Paris of the West. Um, you would be amazed at the built at the homes that were there. There were all it was just row after row of historic Victorian homes. And then when the automotive industry started to take off, there was housing needed for the workers and the management and all that. Right. And more got Varney to move from New York to Detroit and to start to develop um, what was radical and um, not always liked uh, apartment buildings. Right. People wanted, Detroit has a huge uh, built environment of single family homes, but he thought that apartments mm -hmm. would be the answer for all these workers and that. Right. So he, they built this uh, but they had him. I, I don't know if you've seen the front of the building. It's quite dramatic. It's Spanish Moore um, architecture yes. uh, in red sandstone. So, I mean, they spent a ton of money on that um, to get uh, to try to convince people, you know, to move from their their homes right. into apartments. Yep. At that time. So uh, Varney was kind of the leader of that in Detroit. And that, it makes sense. I mean, but, but I, I was born in, I was born in Colorado and moving to the, the East coast, there were a lot closer together on the East coast where, you know, but it makes sense from a, from a, you know, sustainability and also, um, you know, just having enough space for everybody to to yeah. to, to have den have dense housing, and and you know what what's right. what's old is is new again because that's a whole debate now. And you know, do we do we you know make make multifamily housing you know to instead of single family houses? Exactly. So it's it's you know that's the thing I love about this whole area. To to me, real estate um, and this his historic adaptation is it's humanity it is. you know it's just uh and i love the way that you got practical in it because um you know at the end of the day it's gotta work you yeah, know it I has mean, to make sense yeah yeah and i'm all for the you know the 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 pure historic preservation i mean i get that but yeah. when you're in detroit and everything is falling down i mean you have got to get 
to be practical about yeah. how are we going to make this work both today. And then our point is, you know, we, when we did the work, we want, we looked to the next hundred years, mm -hmm. right? Can this building survive for right. the next hundred years? Yeah. That's what we were looking for. Yeah. And I, and I think that adaptive reuse, and I'm actually doing a presentation on in, next month, but um, I think adaptive reuse is an answer for buildings that have, have the, whatever they were used for before was, is not useful now. And right. so now, otherwise it's just going to be demolished by neglect uh, because people, you know, and so that, I think it's the answer. Um, and I know there are purists that, you know, just want every building to be saved exactly the way it was, but it's, it, it's not practical and it, and you have to have a balance there. Yeah. And I think we, as you do, I think we need some of that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's right. gotta be part of the answer. And right. in some cases it's a perfect answer for it. Uh, but in many, many, many areas, um, we're losing our history because we're not willing to adapt, right. you know? Yeah, no, um, I so, so I think there has to be a level of adaptation. Uh, and I would say all of our work has been um, embraced by the Historic District Commission. Right. Uh, it's been embraced. Uh, the Elmore is in Preservation Magazine, you know, um, so, you know, that all that is, um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's recognizing that we're offering a, you know, uh, a way to a way to the future, right? Right. Uh, no. we're offering. I, I definitely and it, it's a way to tie, tie our, our past to the future because these, these buildings, once they're saved, then can tell the story of what was there before. Oh yeah, and the 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 point is the uh, the number of people that have stayed at the Elmore. You know, mm -hmm. this is I, I'd say pre-COVID, right? Right. When right. We, were, <laughs> we were in yeah. full. Um, well, and uh, as a inter point of interest, you know, I, I wrote to the residents. You know, the Elmore is already. This is the Elmore's second pandemic. <laughs> you know. Yes. That's it's true. it's our it did yeah. the 1919 pandemic. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So it's um, so this is its second. But the number of people that have stayed there, you know, and have enjoyed its history is, um, you know, I mean, it is now, uh, you know, very active part of, um, you know, of of telling Detroit's history. There's also I I don't know. If, I, I can keep going, but the, you know, so the rooms, the hotel, the, the hotel rooms on the first floor are called the park view. And then we named them, you know, with a historical view of things. So there's oh, the yeah. AC Varney room, the Varney room, but there's also the Casey Kasem room. <laughs> so yeah. Casey Kasem, you would say, what the heck is that all about? Well, when you go back, the, where the greenhouse is, that is on the property where his where he was born and raised. He went to Northwestern uh -huh. um, uh, you, um, High School in Detroit. Um, and then when we found that out that this was the Kasem home, we got a hold of the, his biographer and we got a lot of Kasem memorabilia, some of his handwritten cards, you oh, know, yeah. Um, from oh, his uh, American yeah. 40, uh, top 40 yes, yeah. radio show. We have his handwritten cards with his notes on them and all that. And they're in that room, including his high school pictures, you know, from Northwestern um, oh, High School yeah. and all the way up through kind of that. So that's a Detroit history. Yeah. And so we integrate that, you know, with, with our... So when someone comes to stay there, they learn the history. The Benedict Room, for those that are uh, renovators of historic property, is a collection of all the things we found when we did the renovation oh, in nice. or around the building. Yeah, right. That's really so fun. you have got baseball cards that were in the wall. You have mm -hmm. pictures that were stuck in the wall. I mean, it was just <laughs> all this stuff that... Yeah. Um, 
that was in, you know, in the building uh, at the time, notes left by uh, uh, construction workers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah nope. that's really, that's really fun. Um, and I think that tying history, the history of a place to history that people can relate to makes people want to be engaged with it. It um, is. Yeah, it's exactly right. That's right. Yeah. Very good. Yep. Well, is there yep. anything that you wanted to share that maybe we didn't get a chance to cover? Um, I can't, I, I think we covered just about everything that I had sent over to you, but I, okay. I was thinking if there was anything that you kind of, we were thinking about that, that popped into your mind while we were talking. Well, I, you know, I, the only thing that I would say is um, for people to, you know, um, a couple things, minor things, which is, I would say, T take your time, you know, um, don't let anybody, um, I'm, I'm speaking to your listeners now. Oh, no, I that's fine. I agree. But, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, take your time to learn the history and to get it right from your point of view. Talk to a lot of people, understand how people relate to that history. So when you're dealing with a home in a neighborhood. It's not just the home in a neighborhood. It's everybody is connected to that. Right. So you're in a web, um, you know, of life that you need to become aware of. And um, and sustainability is possible, but if you're in a rush, I, I think you're going to have a hard time with historic meaningful historic preservation and right. you're going to have problems with sustainability because these take time to think through. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean, you know, I mean, we've got <laughs> like, you can imagine right now during COVID, I'm so glad that we did the work on the El a green garage the way we did in the Elmore. Oh, yeah. Our costs are way down, you know I mean? Yeah. So there is a payback back there, but you're going to have to take I think your time uh, up front. Yeah. And then the last thing is there is so much great work that has been done out there by others. Right. Um, we went around and learned from others. You know, it's a great time to become your own, create your own university, talk to the right. people, you know, pick your own teachers, you know, oh, go yeah, visit yeah. places, you know, this is post COVID, but go <laughs> talk to people. Right. Uh, well, and I guess now you can have zoom calls with right, them. Right. Uh, but I would say that that's great. We'd welcome anybody coming up to the Elmore to stay overnight. Um, oh yeah, definitely. But they can uh, learn, um, you know, they can learn. Uh, we also um, have people there that when you come in, uh, if you want all the, if you want the full history tour, they'll give it to you. Oh, Do you know what I mean? Cool. They, yeah. they, we have, we have people that are working there now that were on the design and construction team that, you know, have stayed on with the project. So my only point is take your time, mm -hmm. make it fun for yourself, learn a lot. And, um, and then you'll become the person that's sharing that history with, you know, the, the, the people that are visiting and the next generation and, right. uh, you know, and it, it makes a big difference. Um, yeah. I, I think uh, we, we have been affected by, you know, being involved with this history. So it's uh, many, as you know, many have come before us mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> in this area that you admire and many will come after us and we just have to do our part right now. Yeah. you know yeah it's stewardship it really it is, is. A stewardship. Yeah. yeah 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 and i think i think both environmental and and our built history are very important things to to be stewards of uh i i agree and it's a it, and you become part of a really supportive community one of the reasons i said yes to this was yeah. I went to your site and figured out like, what are you really doing, right? Right, yeah. And like, so when I saw that, I just feel like you and I are in the same community. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, we are. It's just like, yeah. it's like somebody, someone else in that community is calling and asking for some help on yes. getting the word out. So like, how can you say no? Yep. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I enjoyed our conversation and, and I, um, 
I learned, I, I feel like I learned some things about the, the sustainability um, aspect that, that I hadn't, I didn't know before. So I, I really appreciate you sharing, sharing your knowledge and your experiences with me and, and our listeners. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and I'll make well, sure, yeah, I'll make sure on our website that we have the links to both the Elmore and the green garage. Is there any place else or any, any other way that you would want somebody to contact you or is the website the best plan? Yeah, the Green okay. Rod and then the Elmore, if you yes. want to take them to the Elmore main site or the Elmore Lodge, both right. of those are great. Um, just as a side note, um, if anybody's interested in the ongoing story, we are we have a third part of this, okay. which is how to play and eat sustainably, and that's the Seasons Market and the Gardens. Um so the gardens are already open. They're next door to that. We have the historic Delglage Cadillac water tower we use as the entrance. We reclaim that. You get to walk through uh, this water tower that used to be 170 feet above the city of Detroit is now, it had to come down as part right. of a project. And so, and then we're opening uh, a good food, neighborhood good food market. And that's opening in 2001. Um, and we're just trying to figure out where COVID is going and kind of when, yeah. when we'll have a chance to open in a real way. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. I think everybody's kind of in that holding pattern. Hopefully things, things will, will settle down after we get through this, this rough period that we're going into. We're going through a rough yeah. period, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so very good. Well, thank you so much. I enjoyed our, Thanks, I enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for listening to the Practical Preservation Podcast. The resources discussed during this episode are on our website at practicalpreservationservices.com forward slash podcast. If you received value from this episode and know someone else that will get value from it as well, please share it with them. Join us next week for another episode of the Practical Preservation Podcast. For more information on restoring your historic home, visit practicalpreservationservices.com.